please stand with us. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper and love the dead of night and you tell me that you're thinking that I'm never
to us. Amen. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad we have a Heavenly Father who's perfect in every way. Amen. Amen. God is good. Good to see everybody this morning. And man, I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this all week. And if you're new to Cross Point, we're, going, we're doing something right now that we don't normally do, but, but we're doing it. And uh, man, some of the questions you guys are sending in are awesome. And uh, I know a lot of you are thinking about the same thing, and maybe you didn't ask. But uh, anyway, we, we're in week two of a series called Frequently Asked Questions. And what I've done is I've asked you to send in questions, and I didn't get a lot at first, and then um, Derek had the idea, said, let's put it where you can do it anonymous. Now you guys are sending them, all right. That's good, though. That's good, and so uh, we're getting a lot of good stuff, and I've already got next week's packed, and uh, I'm going to try to get in nine today, all right? We're going to work on nine. Trust me, I'm going to move pretty quick. I'm going to give you some scriptures you can go back and look at later on, so get your pens ready. I didn't put all the scriptures in your outline. There just wasn't enough room. And so uh, we'll be getting some scriptures you can go back and do some studying on. Before I get into the message, though, um, the ladies' conference coming up September 16th. You ladies that are going to attend, go ahead and sign up. We're trying to prepare for this, and uh, you can go on to um, chosen.crosspointforyou.org and go ahead and register, and you can pay online, and uh, it's going to be awesome. It's our first ladies' conference. We've I've got two ladies that I know very well that will be speaking, and uh, they're going to share their testimonies and their heart. and. And uh, it's going to start out the first one this year. It's going to be Saturday morning from 9 to 12. They're going to serve you a brunch. And they'll have some breakfast stuff, uh, pastries and stuff when you get here. But um, it's going to be awesome. So you don't want to miss out on this. And, and like I said last week, the men are going to help serve that day. And we're going to be a blessing to you ladies because we know this is going to be a great time as you, get, you ladies come together and worship together. And uh, I'm excited about this. Y'all pray for us tonight. The youth group, which I'm, uh, the youth group is staying in here this morning. And I, and I love our youth. And um, I thought this would be great for them to listen to. The questions are very relevant to where they are. But uh, we're taking them. We're leaving at 2 o'clock today and going to stay in Charlotte tonight. And then tomorrow we're going to spend all day at Carowinds. And so we're going to invest in them tonight. We're going to have a devotion with them tonight and pour into them. And, and uh, I love our young people, and um, I'm looking forward to spending some time with them. But anyway, let's get into it. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is you send in these questions and I am going to do the best I can to answer these questions, okay? Now, as I answer these questions, there are three categories that we will have. Uh, the first category is, if it's black and white in the Bible, and there is scripture on this particular topic, then I will give you scripture of what the Bible says, and there's no room for us to move. Last week, I, I spoke in love uh, to the homosexual people that are involved in that. I love all people. God loves all people. Uh, but we dealt with that situation with what the Bible says, and uh, everyone is welcome here, but that's a black and white situation. It's in God's Word, and that's what I will teach. Now, so any subject that you give me, I'm going to give you Bible. Now, if that subject is not, I'm going to have to stand still today. Anyway, any subject that is not in the Bible, what I will try to do is I will try to use principles in God's Word to help point and answer the question that you have, all right? Now, there are some questions that you've asked that there's nothing in the Bible about it. And I'm going to give you my opinion on it, all right? And you can agree to disagree if you want, but I will tell you this is my opinion. Because a lot of times, you know, the people want to know, what does a pastor think about this? And some of the questions you have sent, there is no clear answer, and so I can just give you my opinion on it. And so that's the three categories that I will give you as we're answering these questions. Now, be careful with your questions that you send in. And I will say, if you want to send in a question today, go to our website or this week, go to your website, and you can put the anonymous question, send it to me, and I'll try to fit it in over the next couple of weeks as we wrap up this series. But uh, keep sending questions in if you want, if you haven't already, or if you get one while we're sitting here uh, and you think about it. But be careful about your question. And I say that because of this. A lot of times in the Christian circle, in Christian circles, what we do is we try to ask a question to point out something that somebody else is doing. Okay? Now just hear me. That's the wrong heart. Last week I talked about how that God's word 
is supposed to be a mirror. In that book of James, James writes, this is the brother of Jesus. He writes and he says, look, we should use this as a mirror to see what God wants to do in our life, and we don't need to use it as a window to see the sins in everybody else's life. Okay? And a lot of Christians are like this. You don't look at it as a mirror. You just try to find the faults in everybody else. And even maybe in your questions, you're doing this to try to say, hey, let's point them out. Let's get them, all right? I want you to talk about this because you need to get them. That's the wrong heart attitude. When you ask a question, it's because you want to know how to please Jesus. And like Denny was saying, uh, thank you for sharing his heart this morning. Um, It's all about Jesus. It's all about what does Jesus want us to do and how do we handle these situations and these questions that you're asking And uh, that's the way I want us to approach it. But every time we look at these things, what does Jesus want us to do about this? So let's dive in. I've got nine to go, all right? Number one, I'll do the best I can. But anyway, number one, what is the question was, what is the big deal about dating a non-believer? Okay? Uh, I've been dealing with this question for years. As a youth pastor, I dealt with it a lot in teen dating. Um, And I'm just going to answer it the best way that I can here. Every date is a potential mate. Everybody that you date, let's say you're in the dating and, and you're, you're dating somebody, every date that you go out on is a potential mate. Why in the world would you go out with somebody and your future is not to possibly marry them? I mean, dating is, that's what you're doing. You are looking for a future spouse. But a lot of people are hung up on this. Well, I, I'm, you know, they're not a believer. They're not, not really Christian. But I'm going to lead them to Christ. I'm going to help them to find Christ, or I'm going to help them become a better person, and I'm going to influence them. But here in 2 Corinthians verse 6, and I think I have this in your outline, here is what Paul says to the church in Corinth. And they were having a lot of problems in Corinth. They were Christians, but they were in a lot of sin. But look, look what he writes to them in, in chapter 6, verse 14. The Bible says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now, Paul is talking about the context of marriage here. Do not be yoked together. And he's talking about the believer and the non-believer. And and by the way, a Christian dating a non-Christian, most likely that non-Christian is going to have more influence in a negative way to that Christian than that Christian is going to have in a positive way for the non-Christian. Over the years, I've just seen this. I've seen it happen so much. And by the way, why would you even date somebody, again, if, you're not, if they're not a potential to marry? Dating is preparing for marrying. You're looking for a future mate, and that's what it is. And young people say, well, I'm just in high school, and I'm just having fun. I'm just dating. Kim and I met in the 10th grade. We started dating. Been together ever since. So every person that you date is a potential mate. And Paul speaks very clearly here. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Maybe some of you are thinking, well, that's kind of arrogant if, if I say that to them, isn't it? You know, they're a non-believer and I'm a believer. Or, or if I say I'm a believer and, and, and I can't date them because they're an unbeliever, isn't that like saying that I'm better than they are? No. What it means is, is you're different. You're different. The gods that you worship are different. And your lives are going to be heading in a different way. And if you have a Christian and a non-Christian, they're just going different directions. And by the way, after the the initial dating and the the fun of the attraction and the hormones and the emotions, when all that is passed, (laughs) you're still going in different directions. I've seen so many couples that started out this way. And, 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 And let me just say, most of the time, I would say it's the girls that ask this question. Can I date them because they're not a believer? And, and let me just say that, that, that you really like this person and you, you have good intentions of changing them. But I would say, girls, if you ask that question, you do not pursue a guy who is not pursuing Jesus. Do not pursue a guy if he is not pursuing Jesus. Because without the heart of Jesus, that person is going to take advantage of you. And a person that is pursuing Jesus is not going to take advantage of your heart because they're moving in the same direction you are. And that's huge. So who, whoever asks this question, and most of the time it's the girls that ask. And I'm not saying it is a girl, but it, whatever, you know, on this dating issue, you're not the Holy Spirit. You don't change that person. You let the Holy Spirit change that person. And if that person changes, if that guy changes just to get you, as soon as he gets you, he's going to change back. 
So you let the Holy Spirit do a work in him. I was just talking to someone this morning, and I said, you know what? You live your life as a young girl, and you prepare yourself for your future husband. Because that's what you want for your husband to be doing. You want him to be following God and growing spiritually and maturing that in that way so that when y'all come together, you're both going to be moving in the same direction. So it's very, very, very clear here. Do not be unequally yoked. You say, well, such and such did it and it worked. Yeah, there are some exceptions. Sometimes it works and the other spouse gets saved. But Paul is very clear here. You're moving in two different directions and you need to go in the same direction as somebody when you marry them that you are moving towards the Lord. Number two, the question is, is it okay for a Christian to have tattoos? All right, just out of curiosity, all right, let's have some fun here. How many people in here, let's just be honest now, how many people in here have a tattoo? Raise your hand. A lot of ink up in here, all right. You're all dying and going to hell, all right, next question. (laughs) I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, that was a joke. That was a joke. Here's the thing. First of all, it is okay to have a tattoo. All right? It's okay. So you're you're okay. All right? It's okay to have it. It's not ungodly. It's not unbiblical. I know some of you are going, Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, it says you can't have tattoos. Yes, you're right. It's in the Bible. It's in there. But now let's put it into context. I'm going to teach you something today. This may be what you take away from this that you'll use in the future. There's three types of Old Testament laws. And you can Google this and and, and look it up and, 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 and just kind of see, do more study on this. There's three types of Old Testament laws. There's the ceremonial law, there is the cultural law, and there is the moral law. Now, the moral law is what is timeless and transfers from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That's moral law, okay? That's the one that you can say, all right, this comes from the Old Testament, moves into the New Testament. Now, ceremonial law and cultural law were during this time period. That was in their culture, and it was things that they did as a, you know, certain things that they did for God at that time. Now, listen to this. Tattoos is a part of cultural and ceremonial law, because this is what was happening. The Israelites were going into the promised land, and when they were going into the promised land, God says, I want you to, to take these people that are living there and just wipe them out, run them out, get them out of there, because this is the land I've given to you. And the thing is, is that these were nations that were being run out of their country, and they would get tattoos to mark their pagan gods. You see, they had these things on here because that was their identity, and, and they didn't think of pagan as a bad. That was just their particular god, but we see them as pagan gods because they're not the one true god. They're worshiping things that aren't true. They're not worthy of being of worshiping. So they had these tattoos marked because that was the gods that they worshipped. And so here in this cultural time, it was saying, hey, if your body was marked with these, you're an Israelite, do not put these tattoos on your body because that means you're worshiping other gods other than the one true God. Now, any of you that raised your hand, I don't think any of you got that tattoo and said, hey, I want to worship a pagan god. <laughs> well, maybe a couple of you. But anyway... I don't think that was the purpose. And you say, well, you know, well, it says the tattoo's in there. Well, are you going to say, all right, in, that, in verse uh, 28, I think it was, the ones that have tattoos, it's against God's law, and you're going to die and go to hell. Well, let's go to the verse before it. In verse 27, Leviticus 19, 27, it says, Do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. How many of you shaved this morning, guys? All right, that means you sin and you're going to hell too, all right? <laughs> this was a cultural thing, law, during this time for the Israelites as they were moving into the promised land. So it is okay that you have a tattoo. All right, the beautiful thing is that God's law, God's moral law, would be like the Ten Commandments. Those are things that carry over. These are things that we follow. These are things that are morally what we do then and we do now. But as far as the tattoos, that was in that culture. So get away from Leviticus 19 and saying, hey, you can't have tattoos. Now, I don't have a tattoo. I've thought about it several times, but I don't have one. But I'm not against anybody that has one. I never have you know, really been. I've always thought, well, why are we always criticizing them? A lot of you have things that really mean a lot to you. Maybe it was a favorite scripture. Maybe it was your mom who's passed away and you got you know, her name on you now or, or something that means a lot to you. And here's the situation. You know, what we have to watch out for when we get tattoos is why are we getting the tattoo? Why are we getting it? Just to fit in? 
just to be cool, to be accepted by somebody? Or does it have a significant meaning to us? And that's the most important part. Because if you're a teenager, let's say, and you come home and you ask mom and dad, can I go? Now, this is for the parents. And they ask you, hey, can I go out with him? He's got a tattoo. Can I go out with him? Parents, this is the way you respond. Do they love Jesus? You don't mark them by their tattoo or the color of their skin. You say, hey, I care about their heart. Do they love Jesus? And that's what we care about. Because that's what God, hey, the Bible says that, hey, man looks on the outer appearance, but God looks at the heart, and God wants to know the heart of our heart and why we're doing what we're doing. And a lot of you have done things, and you've done it for a good reason, and you're not going to die and go to hell, so you're okay about these tattoos. All right, next one, number three. Moving along pretty good here. Is divorce okay when cheating and or abuse has happened? Is divorce okay when cheating or, and or abuse has happened? And I want to start out with Malachi 2.16. And I want us to start out with this. The Bible says, For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart, do not be unfaithful to your wife. According to the Bible, marriage is a covenant. I always tell people before I, I do their wedding ceremony, I say, look, this is not a contract. This is not a thing if it goes good, we're going to stay in it. No, this is a covenant that you make before God. Matthew 19, 6 says this, Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Now, I want to start out by saying this. If you've been divorced, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to make you feel bad. I'm not here to condemn you. The decisions we make from today and forward come from what we hear from God's word. And that's what I want us to focus on. And I know that divorce is 50% rate, according to studies. That's in the Christian, you know, Christian area as well. The divorce rate is right up there. And so I'm not here to beat you up, but I am here to tell you that God takes marriage very seriously. God realizes, though, that we're sinners and that we're not perfect and that we make mistakes. The Old Testament, he laid down some laws in order to protect the rights of the divorcees, which were especially the women. And you can write this down. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 24 in the first four verses. You can go and look at some of those things that were in there. The controversy over whether divorce and remarriage is allowed, according to the Bible, revolves primarily around Matthew 5.22. I mean 5.32. Look what the Bible says. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality. Now, I believe that the scripture is clear that it says that divorce can take place if one or the other is unfaithful sexually, immorality in any way to their spouse. That frees you from that marriage. But I believe that Jesus is all about forgiveness. And I believe that Jesus' number one thing, because he hates divorce, is even though that happens, if two people are, are willing to follow God and let God get in the midst and work in that situation, I believe that the ultimate choice that God wants us to do is to work on that relationship no matter what. Now, I realize there are some spouses that continue doing this, and they keep doing it and keep doing it. I'm not saying... You know, just keep forgiving and keep forgiving and keep forgiving. But I'm saying if this happens, it's something you need to work on and let God work in your relationship. But according to Scripture, this is the only one area that clearly states that you can divorce your spouse if sexual immorality. And that covers anything, any kind of sexual immorality whatsoever. The phrase, except for sexual immorality, is the only thing in Scripture that possibly gives God permission for divorce. And we need to understand that. Now, I'm, again, I'm not trying to beat you up from your past, but I'm saying from this point on, we have to understand God's word. Maybe you're struggling in your relationship. Let me just say this. If there is abuse in your relationship, if there is a man that is laying his hands on you physically, you do not stay in that environment. You get your kids and you get yourself out of there, away from that. I'm not saying because you're married you have to live in that. A man has no right to put his hands on you physically and abuse you as a lady. That cannot happen. And if he does, I'm telling you, remove yourself from that and go to the authorities and get some help. But clearly, divorce is accepted whenever there is sexual immorality between 
and there's any outside any sexual immorality going on outside of the marriage. But again, as your pastor, I think too many couples just jump out too quick. When things get tough, you just jump ship. Next month, I will be married 34 years. I know I don't even look 34 years old, do I? But anyway, <laughs> been married 34 years. We dated three years, four years before that. I told her she leaves me now. I'm going with her. It's not been easy. It's been hard. It's been hard work. And if I were to just to jump ship or she was just to jump ship because it got hard, that's not the right reason. The closer we've gotten to Christ and the more we've allowed him to work in our relationship, the closer we have become. And I can say right now, we're best friends like never before. That's not because we're good. It's because we're closer to God now in our life than we've probably ever been. And that drew us closer together. So try to work through it, even though sometimes Satan slips in. We're not perfect. Try to work through it in any situation. But the answer to that question is, is clearly divorce can be separate. It can be it's acceptable under when sexual immorality takes place. All right, next question, number four. How do you talk to an atheist? Now, some of these questions I got several different angles on, and so I try to put some of these questions just as that'll, that kind of include everything. So how do you talk to atheists? A couple of things here. You can get a lot further with someone like this by asking them questions than making declarations. I personally don't believe there is anyone who is atheist. You say, well, Pastor, I know somebody that's atheist because they told me they was. I know they'll tell you they were, but I don't believe there is anything such as an atheist other than just being called that name. Why do you say that, Pastor? I'll use Romans 1.19. I like the King James Version on this particular verse. This is where I first saw this in this version. But look what it says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. In other words, every single person, whether they say that God exists or not, it's manifest in them. It was put in them that God exists. It's manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. I believe that God has put it in them. A lot of people claim that they're atheists because they want attention. And then there's other people that claim that they're atheists because their lifestyle does not match up with Jesus. And so therefore, they don't want to acknowledge that there is a God. They want to be their own God. And an atheist, a lot of times, is just some person that's saying, I want to be my own God, and I want to claim my own shots, call my own shots, and I'm just going to say there is no God. But when something happens serious in their life, I'll guarantee you inside, they know that God exists. They know that there is a superior being. Now, an atheist, I'll look that up, and look what it says that an atheist, an atheist is. An atheist is a person who denies or disbelieves the existence of a supreme being or beings. But I don't believe that. I believe that God has put it in every one of us. And therefore, when someone says they're an atheist, when you're talking to them, don't argue them with them. Don't throw a Bible at them. Just ask them questions. Say things like, why are you an atheist? You see, because there is a reason that they've been pushed in that direction. There is a reason why they have gone there. And, and, and sometimes in young adults, if they've been in a very traditional, very critic, critical, very uh, you know, uh, traditional kind of situation where it was so strict and they couldn't do nothing, they couldn't have any fun, a lot of times when young people become of age to call their own shots, they push away from Christianity. And they may go online and find some things and come across the thing that says atheist, that there is no God. And they go, yeah, that's what I want to believe. I'm going to be an atheist. And so they're searching for something because there's a background where they were taught how to hate church. And a lot of people claim to be atheists. And I encourage you, the next time you cross somebody, don't get upset with them. Try to look that there's an underlying reason why they're going in that direction. There's a reason why they're acting out this way. And when you start asking them questions and they start opening them up and you give them some good attention, now all of a sudden they think, wow, this person really cares about me. They're not judging me. They're not throwing rocks at me like that previous, it may have been, environment that they were in. And now all of a sudden they're starting to be receptive of you. And then you can have a friendship with them and you can share with them what happened in your life and how God blessed you in this area and just be nice but show them victories in your life. And now all of a sudden, you watch. God can use that 
to point them to him through your life. But if you cut off that relationship by just trying to be right, I've seen too many Christians try to be right. You just want to be right. Bless God, it's in the Bible. It can be in the Bible. But they ain't going to listen to you because of your attitude and your arrogance. The Bible says you show them love. You let them know you care about them. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, you know, this person's different. That's not like what I had seen before that was so, all these rules and regulations, you know, and, you know, and so now all of a sudden they'll start listening to you. So my advice to you would be, if you talk to somebody that's atheist, whether it's a family member or a friend, you keep the relationship going and you show them love. And don't judge them. Even though you know there's a God, you give it time for the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in their life. Parents, if your child is going through this, maybe it will just be a stage that they'll go through. Maybe it's a time that they just have to work this out and work out their independence, and they've got to own their own spiritual walk. A lot of times kids that have been grown up in church and raised in church and they've been made to go to church, when they do get a freedom to be able to not go to church, they may go through a stage like this. But my advice to you is if you're a parent and a child is going through this thing of calling themselves an atheist, you keep the lines of communications open. You keep it open so that when they do figure this thing out and they come back around to God, you haven't shut the doors and been so cruel to them, they can come back to a loving mom and dad. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, He, which is God, has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to the end. So God has placed eternity in our heart, and, and hopefully they'll come back around to it. All right, so hopefully that helps you with that one. Number five, I have a hard time doing devotions daily. What can I do? Maybe you're like a lot of people and you say, all right, I'm going to start reading my Bible. Young people, you know, you say, I'm going to start reading my Bible. And all of a sudden you start strong and then you just kind of fall away, right? It happens a lot of times. You'll start out doing, you go a week, two weeks, maybe even three weeks, and, and you just, well, let me just tell you something. You're probably never going to get to the point where you just wake up in the morning and go, I can't wait to do my devotion and pray for 30 minutes. Now, this is just being a reality. Why? Because life is going on. We live in a busy world. You're probably going to wake up some mornings knowing I've got to do this, but maybe not today because I've got to fix breakfast or I've got to go and, and do this. I'd rather just sit and have a cup of coffee or, or you know, I've got my to-do list I need to work on. and All these things are going, and you get out of a routine. But just understand, that's part of it. Listen, your spiritual devotional time is a discipline. It's something you do every day whether you want to or not. It's the same thing that an athlete becomes a great athlete. Why? They're willing to do the discipline every single day. They're willing to put in the time, whether they feel like it or not, they're going to put in the time because they know it's going to pay off in the long run. And you and I as Christ followers, we have to make it a habit, whether we want to or not. And I'm just being honest and transparent. See, there's, there's days that I would rather get my day started and start knocking out all these things that are coming at me rather than spending my time with the Lord. The Bible, I mean, the, the studies show that it, that it takes the human brain seven weeks to create a new habit. Seven, that's a long time. How many of you make it to seven weeks most of the time when you get all fired up and say, I'm going to do this? No, we don't make it past the first week, do we, most of the time? Seven weeks to make it a habit. Now, let me, let me just share this with you. Some days during your quiet time, it's going to be amazing. I mean, the words are going to jump off the page. I mean, it's just going to be like God speaking to you, and you're going to be like, wow, God, you just answered my prayer. Man, I'm so excited to go through my day now. And it's just going to be awesome. And then some days you're going to go, I just read, and I don't understand a thing that I just read. Any of you been like that? <laughs> Your pastor's been like that before, right? You know, you've read, and you're like, God, I, that didn't mean a thing. I didn't understand it. I didn't. This is what I want you to do. On days like that, you just pray, dear God, I didn't understand, understand a thing I just read. <laughs> he already knows that. But God, you wrote it. And God, if you wrote it, then I know you wrote it for a purpose. And I know, God, one day you will explain to me why you wrote that. And thank you for giving me your word that I got to read it, even though I didn't understand it. And when you start putting the word of God in you, and you start getting it in you, whether you it's not, it doesn't matter whether you feel good or not. And that's where we fail. If it doesn't feel good, we quit doing it. It shows that, that God's word is important to you. It shows you that, hey, it's important. My devotion time with God 
is at the top of my list, and it's a priority because I love my God. And therefore, you do this. So devotional time is important, and it's not always fun. Just like the important things that we do, a lot of times it's not fun, but we know as a discipline we have to do it. It's the right thing to do, and it's going to benefit us in the long run. And when you start putting this information in your mind and in your life and in your heart, God can pull that stuff out to your memory at any point in time. I've had that before. I was like, wow, I didn't even know that was in the Bible. I don't remember that verse. And all of a sudden it just came to. You've got to get the stuff in your life and in your heart so that you can show God that, hey, I love you, and it matters whether I feel good or not. And another thing I want to just say about devotional time, for whoever wrote this, and many of you are probably thinking the same, same thing, um, whenever you have a devotional time, find out what fires you up for Jesus because we're wired differently. Some, some guys say, I don't like to read. And I understand that. You don't like to read. That's not your favorite thing that you like doing. Maybe get you the Bible on some kind of something where it will read to you. Maybe some of you, man, you just really get close to Jesus in your worship. Uh, some of the kids that, that, that we have, are, 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 they love music. I mean, music is part of their life, man. I mean, they love to sing. They just love it. And maybe music is your way of worship in the morning and the lyrics in the song that mean things to you. Maybe it's reading the Bible. Maybe it's just prayer. Maybe it's just taking a walk. Whatever it is, find out what really fires you up for the Lord in, in your devotion time and do those things. Now, if, if, when you start your devotion, if you're not doing one now, give me five minutes a day. And I've done this before, but it's time that you do this. Five minutes a day and just read for five minutes. And maybe think about it all day long, just that little bit you read. Maybe something jumped out, and you're just thinking, all right, that verse right there just keeps running through my mind. I was having a time with the kids the other day, and I sang a song, and I was doing this kind of on purpose, and I just kind of sang the song out loud at the breakfast table, and next thing you know, I just kind of was quiet, and next thing you know, the kids were singing that song. You know, <laughs> you ever done that? You know what I'm talking about? You get a song in your head, and you can't get it out, right? And it's the same principle. You get this in your head, and you just kind of... Think about it. Think about it. Maybe you'll move up to 10 minutes. Maybe you do 30-minute devotion, wherever you're up to now. The thing is, is you got to get started some way and get godly things in your mind. And let me just say this as well. It's not just a five-minute thing in the morning. Okay, God, I had my time with you in the morning. No, it carries on throughout the day. Continue to put godly things in your head. When you think about devotion, you're always living your life and letting God walk with you on a daily basis in your music, in your car, in your relationships that you have, and you're talking about the Lord Get the Bible app on your phone, and maybe during your break or something, you just read a few verses. But constantly throughout the day, you're wanting to get the things of God in you. Number six, and this is a serious one. How do I recover from the pain of being sexually molested? Studies show that one out of three women will be sexually abused by the age of 18. One out of three. And one out of six guys sexually abused by the time that they're 18. And let me just tell you, if you've been sexually abused, there's no easy fix. No easy fix. It's going to take time. It's going to take work. A lot of conversations and, 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 and time in God's word and prayer and sitting under the God's word. And it's just it's going to take time. And I'm sorry for what has happened to you. And there's a lot of this that goes on that's never even recorded. Some of you may be living with something that happened you've never even ever told anybody. But let me just tell you this. You, the main thing is you have to start moving away from it. You have to choose to move through the pain instead of living in the pain. The main thing is that tomorrow you're not going to be at the same place you are today. You're moving away from the pain, not staying in it. If you were abused, you were affected. You were affected. It's going to leave some pain, scars and wounds and trust issues. It's going to happen, but the main thing is that you don't pitch a tent and just stay there and sulk and leave it inside and don't deal with it. If you're suffering from sexual abuse, let me tell you something. You need to talk to somebody. You don't need to keep that out inside you because it is affecting you in some way. You've got to get it out, and you've got to start moving away from it. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how if it's just happened recently. You've got to get it out of your system. And let me just tell you this. God has seen and felt your pain. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows that your heart's been broken because when your heart was broken, his heart was broken. When you shed tears, he shed tears. But let me just tell you something. He loves you. 
And if you're a girl, you're his daughter. And if you're a boy, you're his son. And he'll never walk away from you and he'll never hurt you. And he'll never turn his life away from you. I'm sorry it happened to you. There's no excuse for it. It's a horrible thing. But my prayer for you is that you don't stay in it. You start moving through it. And letting the Lord and some people help you out. Number seven. Here's another serious one. And this is one that I have to be very careful on. I knew this was coming. <laughs> I, I knew it was coming. Uh, some of these that we've gone over are very popular. I did a series similar to this called Gray Areas about five or six years ago. And some of these questions were dealt with then. This is another serious one that a lot of people have to deal with, and it's on suicide. Question number seven, if you commit suicide, will you go to hell? And I think this one is very clear. I think we've complicated it, but I think this one's very clear, and I'm going to give you some scripture on it. But there are a lot of people dealing with some really tough issues. They're anxious. They're borderline depressed. Um, they're even at the point of contemplating suicide. And a lot of times, people that are really dealing with these situations are suffering, and they don't know how to deal with it. But it's very serious. If you're going through a tough season in your life and the darkness is there and the despair and hopelessness, I want to help you today. Let me just say this. The reason a person goes to heaven simply has to do with Jesus. Now, I've got to be careful with this. But the Bible says that in John 14, 6, that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way to heaven. It's whether or not you receive Jesus into your life and whether or not you follow Jesus Christ in your life. Only Jesus, nothing else but Jesus. Salvation is someone who accepts Jesus into their life and they meet Jesus. Salvation in any other thing than Jesus is it, we have a problem. Now, I know we got different denominations in here. You know, we're non-denominational because I don't believe there's going to be any denominations in heaven. That question didn't come in yet, but I think we've clarified that enough. Um, there's not going to be Pentecostals and then Baptists and then, and then, then the, uh, holiness churches and church of God. There's not going to be that. No, it's going to be whether or not you receive Christ or not. And whenever we have a church that's non-denominational, you get different walks and different, you know, you've been at different settings in church and they teach different things. But I believe that it's only Jesus it's not by works, it's not by church membership, it's not by baptism, it's not by all these things. The only way you're going to get into heaven is if you meet Jesus. That's it. And anything else we add to it is something that we're doing. And Jesus did what we can't do. Jesus was perfect. Jesus did not, was not delivered from death. Jesus was delivered through death because that was his purpose. And because what he did on the cross, now our sins are forgiven. The past, the present, and the future. It's not on what we do. So let me just make it clear right now that no matter what we do in life, if you have met Jesus, that's how you go to heaven. If you have not met Jesus, you will not make it to heaven. It's that simple. And I think sometimes churches make it too difficult. And I'm not, I just want to say this. I am not excusing someone to go out and say, oh, I've met Jesus, now I can go take my life. I was on the phone last night with someone who had no idea I was going to be talking about this today. About not wanting to live anymore. Let me just tell you, that is not the solution. If you have met Jesus, you will go to heaven. If you have not met Jesus, you will not go to heaven. It doesn't matter what we do. But let me just tell you, that suicide is not a solution. You cannot play God. God decides when we live and when we die. We don't make that choice because when we do, then we put ourselves in the place of God, and we cannot do that. Let me just tell you something. Suicide is one of the most selfish, inconsiderate acts that anyone can do. Maybe you've dealt with this in your family. I know I've had friends that have lost people to suicide. I've had friends that have lost people that have committed suicide and I have seen the pain and the damage that has been left behind. And for anyone to take their own life is a very selfish act to relieve what they think, you know, is just something God can't help them with. I look at it this way. There are some situations that are horrible 
I believe that there are some mental illness. There's a lot of that in our, in our world today, mental illness. And there's things that go on in people's minds. I know good Christians who have gotten mental illness, and now they're a different person because of that mental illness. Have they, and if they have met Jesus, they have met Jesus no matter what they do. I know there's some people that have taken their life that are Christians. And because they have met Jesus, they are in heaven. I don't believe that people go to heaven uh, you know, on anything else than other than meeting Jesus. And I don't believe that people go to hell because they commit suicide. Catholicism, in the, way back in the Middle, Age, middle, middle Ages, Catholicism is where this started. They would teach that if you committed suicide that you went to hell. And there are even some circles in, in, in evangelism or uh, in circles of religions today that it teach that if you commit suicide, you're going to hell. And I don't believe that at all. I believe you go to hell because you have not met Jesus. And that alone. And again, I say this. If you are suffering and you're going through something, God did not deliver Jesus from the cross and death. He delivered him through it. And because you're going through something, you allow God to deliver it through you. Don't you stop what God wants to do. Sometimes we'll be put in situations where God wants to use us in a way, and even though we may not like that way, we don't take our life and end what God's doing. That is the wrong solution. You let God decide that. Realize that Christ is there for you. And if you, Matthew 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. If Jesus Christ lives in us, then no matter what we're going through, we can overcome. And one more thing I want to say about this, because there's a whole other thing with Christian circles about this. If any of you are going through something because of circumstances or mental illness or chemical imbalances, it's okay to take medicine. I have heard pastors say, you just let God handle it. You don't take any medicine. And I think that's absolutely ridiculous. God created the medicine as well. God's created all things. I had a family member one time that was like that. They didn't believe in hospitals. They didn't believe in any kind of doctors. You don't take medicine. You just let God fix everything. And that is just absurd. If you had a heart problem, and the doctor said, here, take this pill and make your heart better, you take it, wouldn't you? Well, if you've got a chemical imbalance in your brain that you can't control, take something to help balance it out. Don't keep suffering because you think it's wrong to take antidepressants. I've taken them over the years. I've gone through bouts of depression in my life. I've had some rough times in my life where I, it was bad. So those of you that struggle with depression, I know. You know, studies show that 7 out of 10 pastors struggle with depression from time to time because of the stress, because of you know, what comes at you. And so it's okay to take medicine. I'm telling you as your pastor, it's okay. But you need to talk to someone and get some help. If you have any thoughts of suicide, because suicide is not the solution. It's not the solution. I'm going to skip number eight, and I'm going to go to that one next, next week. Um, and I want to go ahead and go to number nine as we wrap this up today. And I hope this has been a help to you. I hope that you'll go do some more study, and I hope that you'll look up some of these verses and go back and read it, and maybe I've hit something that's close to home. Maybe it's something that God wants to use to help somebody else. But these are real questions that a lot of us have. The last question I want to do today is, how do you know if you received Christ? I've had people ask me that a lot of times. How do you know if you've really received Christ or not? You know, I mean, how do you just know, no, no? Well, let me ask you this. How do you know you're married? I don't know anyone that walked in this church that's married today, and you came in here and go, I don't know if I'm married or not. <laughs> I know that's kind of silly, but for some of you, you know, uh, you, can you remember when you got married? Man, you need to make sure you know this, this is important. Know when you got married. What scares me is there's a lot of people in this church that don't really know if they ever met Jesus. I hear things like, I, well, I think I have. You know, I, I think there might have been one time that, you know, I, yeah, well, I, I'm not sure. And it scares me that there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians. They're not saved. They've never met Jesus. I think a lot of times, especially young people, young people listen to this. You have to own your own relationship with Christ. 
you know, a lot of times when children come to school with their parents and you've got godly parents and you think, well, I'm okay because my parents are okay. No, you have to decide and make that relationship on your own. And what really amazes me that maybe some of you adults have been that way. You know, I've just been in church all my life, so God must love me. Have you met Jesus? And do you remember a time and a place? Now, I'm not saying exact time and exact date. My wife doesn't know the exact date. She knows she was young, and she remembers the time when she did. But she can't give you, I can give you the exact date and time. I remember I was 29 years old, and, and I know. And not only that, I remember when I met Christ because he changed me. The way that I live my life changed. I, from that point on, what happened was, was I said, I'm not going to call the shots in my life. I'm going to let God do that. I'm going to let him be the one that makes the decisions in my life. And that's what points me in my direction now. And so I know there was a change in my life. You may be saying, well, I was a little kid and I really didn't have this big horrible testimony and all this kind of stuff. But you remember that you received Christ and now your decisions are based on biblical principles that you have learned. Then you are a child of God. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, this will be the last verse that I read. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. He says, I write these things so you don't have to worry about it. I write these things so that you can know that you have eternal life. One of the questions we'll have next week is, can you lose your salvation? I got that question. We'll deal with that next week. I've got some good ones next week that are coming up. If you've got more, send them my way. I'm, I'm having fun reading and studying and looking these up and, and having a good time with it. But most of all, I want to help you because this is the questions that you have. How do I know if I, I'm a believer? Because you know there was a time that you said, God, you take over the controls and lead my life, and I'm going to follow you. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fight with them from time to time on decisions. It's going to happen. But you know you've relinquished control to Him, without a doubt. Then you can know that you're saved of your sin. You've been forgiven. He's done what you cannot do. So the question is, is have you believed in Jesus? Have you believed? Have you said, Jesus, I turned from my old life and now you're in control. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to put you in control. Let's all bow your heads this morning. I think that there are probably some of you here today that when I said that, you, you couldn't really remember a time that you've relinquished control to the Lord. And my prayer for you is that you will let Him lead your life. Submit control over to Him because He created you he died for you so that your sins could be forgiven why don't you let him lead your life and again I think there's a lot of Christians you really think that you're okay but the whole thing is have you met Jesus have you met Jesus and given him control of your life because your life is going to be different. It's going to be obvious. People are going to see it. People are going to know it because of the decisions you're making. And if there's never been a time like that, today is the day to receive Christ. Relinquish control to Him. The Bible says if you'll confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. He will. He's the only one that can do it. He'll forgive you of your sins in the past, in the current, and in the future. It'll be washed under the blood. But only he can do it if you relinquish control of him. Has there been a time? If you're here and you say, Pastor Carl, I've never really turned my life over to him. And I believe at this moment right now, the Holy Spirit is drawing me into relationship with him. This is serious. Because if he's drawing you right now, and if you're watching on, on, on broadcast and he's drawing you right now, Satan is trying to tell you, just hold off. Don't do it right now. You can do it later. Satan's going to try to distract. But I'm telling you, if this moment is for you and your heart's beating and you know you need to relinquish control to Jesus, right now is the time that you need to do it. Don't wait. Don't wait. Let him have control. I mean total control. 
everything in your life. And if there's sin in your life, repent and ask him to forgive you and say, I'm sorry. If you're here and you say, Pastor Carl, I want to receive Christ, I want you to call out to him right now and ask him to forgive you of your sin. Call out to him. Just say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I've been trying to do it on my own, but I'm going to relinquish control to you because you're the one that died for my sins. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin and I turn everything over to you. I'm yours. I'm yours. It's a heart condition. And God knows every person that heard my voice today and you relinquish control to his drawing of the Holy Spirit, you relinquish control to him. He knows. <laughs> we have a God that knows everything. He's all-knowing. That's way above our minds can even comprehend. The Bible says that there is celebrating in heaven for one person that repents, one person that turns to him. They're, they are celebrating because they know that you received and that, that heaven's going to be your eternal home now, and they're celebrating. That's a big thing, way bigger than us. Let the Lord control your life and let him show you your purpose. And if you've been contemplating suicide, that's not even an option. Get it off the table. You just follow him and work through it. You say, Pastor Carl, I'm here. The Holy Spirit drew me. And now I know I received Christ into my life. I met Jesus today. And I'm serious. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I bet there's some of you in here that's like that today. You relinquish control today. And if that's you, I want you to be honest with me right now. And I want you to just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that was me. Because I want to rejoice with you. So just raise your hand right now. Don't even hesitate. Say, Pastor, I met Jesus today. Lift your hands up real real high. Somebody today, just hold it up high so I can see it. Thank you for that one right there to my right. Thank you for that one to my left. Somebody else, you say, Pastor, I relinquished control to the Lord. This is a huge. There's nothing to be ashamed about with that. No. There's nothing to be ashamed. Everybody here is pulling for anybody that does not know Christ. That's why, man, we rejoice. We're happy because we have made that decision at some point in our life, and now you have. And it's awesome. Somebody else, you say, Pastor, that's me. If you haven't raised your hand, lift your hand up right now and say, Pastor, that's me. I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. Anybody else? I want to wrap it up with this. If you've got something going on in your life, don't do it alone. Get with somebody. Let me know. And I'll get you with somebody that will help you through it. You don't need to go through it by yourself. There's a lot of questions we have. There's a lot of answers we get from God's Word, but the one answer that's common and true is He will never leave you and He will never forsake you. He is there for you through your, your whatever circumstance, whatever trial you're going through. Father, we love you, and I can't thank you enough for those that have met you today. They've given control to you. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for the decisions made here today. Lord, we've learned some things from your Word. And God, I pray that we will use these and we will plant them in our heart. We will apply them. But also, God, take this and use it for these difficult situations that we have in life. And God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, the truth in it. We know it's the right way. And Father, we love you and we praise you in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Amen. Those that celebrate with those that accepted Christ.